Uh, my father was a, uh, was a merchant navy seaman. Uh, he came from Somaliland. Uh, like many people from Somaliland, uh, they worked really hard uh, to come to this country. Um, when the Civil War broke out uh, back home, uh, they came and settled, uh, bought uh, the other house so my mum. And then, yeah, we had a big family. And I've always found um, Cardiff a welcoming place. I've always found Wales really welcoming. I genuinely never had any issues, I feel, um, you know, growing up uh, in, in, in this community. Not that I travel far, a lot of my work is across Butel and Grangetown. That's just that, like, you know, square mile down the road here. But, um, yeah, I think, just to get back on my thought train. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, I went to school here, uh, went to college here, I graduated uh, in university here in Wales. And I think it wasn't until uh, 2006 when I really uh, found that term representation or overly represented uh, in data and in statistics. So I was headhunted uh, when I graduated uh, from university for a program uh, called the Raise the Achievement Program. Uh, it, it was RAPS, Raise the Achievement Program. It was a local authority program, really looking at tackling the representation uh, in, in, in higher, in, in, in underachievement. So there were young people uh, from my community who looked like me, who lived in uh, many parts of uh, Butown, Grangetown, Splot, uh, who are highly represented in these figures of underachievement. And I didn't say right with me, I just graduated, I was high on life, if you like, and I wanted to go and pursue a, a job in my area that I graduated, but I couldn't just sit there and think, oh, wow, so just you know, say, hang on and like, see other young people uh, from my community not succeed. So I took on a role, uh, there was a small team of us, who worked tirelessly? You know, we put on under, we put on um, sorry extracurricular activities after school across three or four communities in Splot, in Grangetown, in Riverside, uh, in Butown. There was opportunities for young people who were attacked, so we case loaded clients, if you like, or young people from across our uh, client, from our from high schools in the city, and we worked tirelessly to mentor them, support them, work with their parents, work with teachers to really move this figure. So I mean, we have, we're presented with this data, with this table, this graph, and literally young people that we were working with that were, under, that were highly represented but from our community featured really lowly. And like I said, that didn't sit right with us. And so yeah, we worked really hard to try and get that peak going. And we did, we were really successful. Um, in fact, you know, we spent four to five years on that program. It was so successful that it got pulled. <laughs> And the reason it got pulled is because they recognized another group was failing and they thought, okay, well, we need another group of people who look like that group to go and tackle that problem <laughs> instead of keeping the two going. But I was fine. I left that program uh, and I went to work with the local authority again because there was another phenomenon or another big issue, needs. Not in education, employment, and training. Again, young people from Butown, Grangetown, Riverside, uh, from my walk of life, were highly represented again in this neat figure. And Cardiff had an ambition to be neat free. They wanted to identify every young person and make sure they were either in education, employment, or training. So again, I was working with the career service and uh, again, another small team, like a little task force to put together to say, look, can you go and identify these young people and plug them into an op their opportunities? And there were plenty of opportunities out there, lots of different service providers doing stuff. But obviously there was a real disconnect. They couldn't reach out to communities like, like mine. But I found it really easy. <laughs> the names, Abdis, <laughs> Akdis, Ahmeds, Abdullahs, Hassans, these are kids in our community. They were, I, I was doing a lot of youth work in the evenings myself, and I found it really easy actually to identify these young people. And many of them actually were in opportunities or were plugged into the system. It's just that sometimes the system were catching up with the young people. And obviously those who weren't in the system, you know, we were easily able to say refer them back to ourselves. So I saw, if I saw somebody in a youth club in the evening, I'd say, listen, come and see me when you wake up tomorrow around 12, 1 o'clock, because you're not going to get up at 10 or 9. <laughs> I'd be at the library or the hub, and then we'd support them into the various opportunities uh, that we had available. And again, hugely successful program. Uh, and you know, we were like detectives, knocking doors, uh, you know, visiting local parks and seeing kids playing football, say, hey, Lou, come over. Is this you? Yep, okay. <laughs> we know where you are now. So uh, yeah, really successful in again, plugging your people into all these opportunities. And then when I left that role in about 2012, that's when I come across community organizing. And uh, that's where you heard a little bit of the introduction there. So with my community organizing hat on, 
when I was first introduced to community organizing, one of the biggest questions I was asked was, what are the biggest issues facing you and your community? And what are some of the uh, what are some of the biggest issues facing you and your community? And there were a whole host of things that were putting pressure on my community or communities in Butown and Grangetown. Now, many of you may have went for a cheeky Nando's on your way here, or you might even be planning to go for one before it closes tonight. But did you know in 2013, before 2013, sorry, many Muslims, or Muslims in general, couldn't eat at any halal Nando's restaurant in Cardiff? The nearest Nando's that was halal was in Nangaru, an area where there's little or no Muslims living there. <laughs> So if you wanted to get a cheeky Nando's, they cooped us all up in the valleys. We, that's where we had to go to go and get a Nando's. Until a group of young people took it upon themselves to take action. And said, enough's enough. So in 2013, they campaigned and they worked hard and they used the principles of community organizing, the five steps to social change, to, take real, to, take it, to work together and, create, and, and make change happen. So they identified the most senior person in Nando's that could make the decision on making Nando's halal. And they were successful. So the biggest restaurant now, the biggest of the three, is now halal. But they could have done that had they not used the five steps to social change. It had they not organized themselves and come together with Muslims and non-Muslims. So it wasn't a case of just the Muslims who were angry about this. You know, young boys and girls who were going out with each other or, you know, hanging around with each other were from all sorts of backgrounds. So we're like, well... Actually, this is an issue for me too. I don't want to see you eating vegetarian food in, uh, in Nando's when they sell chicken. <laughs> you know, so we organized ourselves. We planned an action. We listened to the community. We listened to see if, people res if this issue resonated uh, with everybody else. So we you know, took a real opportunity to go into high schools and in the community and say, look, you know, is this an issue? Do you want to continue to travel up to Nangaru? Or do you want to, you know, if we could make, action, if we make change happen, would you eat locally here? Absolutely. So there was a real momentum. There was a real opportunity there. So we organized, we listened, we planned, and then we took action. We took action to get a reaction. We had planned the one afternoon on a Saturday afternoon to take over the Nando's in the bay, and we identified that there are 16 seats in the restaurant. So we found 60 people who would go up to the till and ask for halal chicken. They obviously wouldn't sell halal chicken. <laughs> So they asked for a bottomless drink instead. So they were going to sit there all day and just literally have bottomless drinks, hit them where they hurts, until they reacted. So we had a campaign going online on social media, Halal Nando's for Cardiff, you can probably still search it now. And Nando's reached out to us and said, whoa, 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 what are you guys planning to do on that Saturday afternoon? Because we knew exactly when they make the most money. And so they reached out to us, they slid into our DMs, and uh, yeah, we got a reaction. So we had a meeting with the chief executives, the young people gathered, they engaged. The first meeting didn't go so well, they weren't planning on opening any new restaurants. So they said, look, you know, actually, actually we've done our review of all our restaurants. And, you know, in the future, maybe we'll uh, consider opening uh, a Halal Nando's. But yeah, lo and behold, I didn't sit right with the young people. So we, 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 we got back to around the table. We, you know, we organized ourselves again. And we had a second follow-up meeting. And yeah, in that follow-up meeting, things went better. We had a lot of statistics and data with us this time, and we felt they couldn't say no. They couldn't say no. And yeah, lo and behold, a couple of months later, they reached out to us and said, look, we're going halal. We're converting one of the three restaurants in the city into halal. So yeah, now, you know, you can taste the success. You can go and have the Muslim brothers and sisters in the crowd and go and have a halal chicken tonight. Not on me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so um, after tasting the success there, I think, you know, it really galvanized me into getting more involved in community organizing. And so I'm going to share a few stories of some campaigns that I've been involved with, which have, you know, and bringing your people through that process and really witnessing and seeing change. So I mentioned earlier about the importance of role models and how young people from uh, my community, if you like, were overly represented in this data and how we overcome that. And then we support them to get away from being neat and being in education, employment and training. But another phenomenon happened. So they're following university, they're going in to get degrees, they're getting masters, and all of a sudden we're finding that these young people are not staying in Cardiff. They're not staying in Wales with their degrees. They're not getting jobs in the city. And that's not because they're not applying to these opportunities. They are applying. They, some of them are even getting shortlisted, not many of them. <laughs> 
but there's obviously something wrong with the recruitment process. And so we started listening further, and we went even deeper into some of this listening. And young people were telling us they're applying for jobs, not hurrying back, and it's you know it's a real you know uh, tragedy when you real when you when you hear some of those stories of young people who want to stay close to home, but have to pack up and leave. My sister didn't have to do that; she wanted to go. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so we organised ourselves. And obviously, you know, you know, the bay here, particularly, you know, we've got the, the the power base with the Welsh Parliament. We've got the local authority not far from here. There's lots of redevelopment that's happened here in the bay, and also the city centre. Over the last 20 years, the bay, the city centre, lots of jobs and opportunities. But actually, how representative are, how representative are we? How representative? How diverse are our workforces? And I know it's very popular now since, you know, Black Lives Matter and all, unfortunately, with, with George Floyd. But prior to that, we've been working on these campaigns and listening to young people and trying to, you know, uh, make, make change happen. And we did. We reached out to, I think, 40 employers initially, and about half of them responded back. And what we gathered from those half was actually some of them wanted to employ people from our community but just didn't know how. But they were spending shed loads of money, you know, putting things on Indeed.com and other places, just hoping, you know, that our people would just walk through the door one day. <laughs> but that wasn't happening. So again, we engaged with them. We st when we started to understand the picture and what was going on, we said, okay, great. We're going to go and form a, a community jobs compact. We're going to work with you to make a reality for, the, for future generations. We don't want them to be uh, traveling to, you know, London and leaving the country. You know, if they have to, great. But if they have jobs that they could do on their doorstep, why can't they stay here, right? So the Community Jobs Compact offered just that. It offered organizations wanting to sign up to it to pay the real living wage. Not poverty wages, pay the real living wage. To sign up to name blind applications. There were young men and women telling us that I genuinely believe it's my foreign sounding name that's prevented me from getting a job. It's my foreign sounding name preventing me from getting a job. It's my postcode, I'm telling you. They're not shortlisted because I live in Butown. They're not shortlisted because I live in Grangetown or Riverside. So we're asking employees, if you sign up to this, name blind applications, pay the real living wage, and conscious bias training for staff. Train your staff to not take into consideration the sound of somebody's name, the air they live, and also have development for those people. People we were speaking to wanted to stay and work their way through organizations. So yeah, we're pleased that that Jobs Compact uh, uh, managed to, I think currently there are 30 employers, including this fabulous institution, the Wales Medium Centre, uh, signed up to, to those principles of hiring local people, not taking into consideration their foreign sound and name, where they live, and training their staff on unconscious bias training. And we're going to continue to reach out to even more employers and more and more. In pursuit of representation, when it comes to sport, again, young people in our community are extremely talented. Extremely talented, whether it's football, athletics, uh, rugby, uh, and other sports. But again, you just have to look at the development and the pathways in many of our national sports and the young people from these communities that are again missing. Yeah, again, missing. Speak to sports coaches in our local communities, and they'll tell you, I got the next, you know, Ryan Giggs, I got the next Harland, you know, the next Mo Farah. But again, they're not represented in any of the development or pathways. But we're not sitting on our laurels. There are young people again campaigning for change, you know, and wanting to make a difference. And so there are NGBs now active in our communities, some better than others, some really digging deep and putting their monies in their pocket, and identifying people in the community who love those sports, and, and, and employing them to go back into the community. Yeah, so kudos to organizations like the Welsh Rugby Union, who've created an apprenticeship scheme, and we've seen young boys from our community, particularly over the last three years, take up their apprenticeship scheme. So that the young boys that look like members of the community now working for those institutions, and it's hugely important. Cricket Wales, Glamorgan Cricket, again, they're the members of our community now employed in those institutions from the community who are able to plug into the talent pathways and other national governing bodies should follow suit. You know, football, athletics, and others. 
so there's a f there are two really good examples of how you know the work we're doing in pursuit of representation is making a difference. Okay, this is a big one now. <laughs> when it comes to police and a criminal justice system, <laughs> again, we're overrepresented in places here. Yeah? So lots of data that's come out recently over the last month or so to show the number of arrests that have taken place or you know how 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 the how the age of this, some of those young people and the arrests have been astronomical. And it doesn't sit right with us again. But what we found out in pursuit again of representation is that they're, they're similar to how I shared earlier about the work we did with careers and the work we did in education, young people who fall off the radar, if you like, uh, or off the straight path, are often caseloaded as well by the police and the criminal justice system. And then they have these panel discussions about these young people, these very young people. And then they refer them to agencies to support them into becoming better, if you like, on a straight path. But why is it that the community is always missing from these caseload meetings? Why is it that youth clubs in our community, the sports clubs, the boxing clubs, are missing from those opportunities? Are you telling me they don't love, they don't have love for those children that they, was, they wouldn't want to support them with the positive outcomes? Big questions need to be asked. <clears throat> but again, in pursuit of representation, we're getting a seat at those tables, yeah? We're organizing ourselves. Over the last 18 months, we've been working on a project to safeguard your people and how to support them into, into thriving. So we know young people do fall off. These things happen. But how do we keep them on track? How do we support them into, into succeeding? So yeah, so the Youth Endowment Fund is supporting us. Uh, and, and in pursuit of uh, our ambition, if you like, to, to support your people across Putin and Greystown into, into thriving and to be the best versions of themselves, we've been given a substantial amount of money now. This is not the council giving us the money, this is not the Welsh government giving us the money, this is uh, you know, the, 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 the Youth Endowment Fund, the funder, now saying, actually, do you know what? We believe in the model, the, the neighborhood approach, the approach that always used to work in the first place into trying to tackle some of these issues. So again, we're going to use that opportunity to tackle that. So I do have hope for the future, like some of the other speakers have shared. And, and in fact, you know, with our Welsh Government uh, anti-racism uh, pledge of 2030, to, to, to end racism, if you like, or to, to anti-racist nation by 2030, and even kind of Council's anti-racism task force to, I know you saw here somewhere, you know, the largest college in the country have signed up to the Black Leadership Group. These are all significant things and firsts for Wales who are leading the way. So yeah, uh, in, you know, in pursuit of representation, yes, uh, it's is important that we keep pushing, we keep hearing about you know, working towards some, you know, leaving this country in a better place for the next generation, for the future generation, that's so important. But also we've got to look after our current generation, the ones who have come through COVID, the ones who are also struggling now because of the cost of the, the pandemic. So yeah, I'll just leave you with that and uh, I'm out. <laughs>